faction. That's promising. That's promising. Make sure I'm muted over here. Yep. I got everything muted. I think we're ready to go. Whoops. Hold on. What the heck is that? Loose you know, speaker wire. One second. Oh boy, technical difficulties. We're not supposed to have technical difficulties. I, I know. Well, actually, it took me a few minutes. I had, I had accidentally unplugged earlier my USB to my thing. So, all right, now we're officially started. Because now everything's plugged back in, and I, I won't kick speaker wires anymore to uh, pop the speakers out. Welcome to the Home Lab Show, Episode Six: Physical Networking. I'm Tom Lawrence, and this is Jay Lacroix. Yes, we want to talk about the physical layer. And we did talk about networking and firewalls, but we want to dive a little bit di di deeper into some of the uh, things like 10 gig and racks. And, you know, it's perfectly timed. You know, this is self-serving. It's not just for the audience. This actually can help Jay because he's it's time to buy a new rack. <laughs> yep, and among other things. So there's other things I'll be asking too. And this is one of the greatest things about Home Lab is because... You know, you get acquainted with people, and when you don't know the answer to something, then maybe someone else will, and then everyone in the group, so to speak, you know, kind of share tips and um, information. So it's always great to get another mindset because sometimes uh, they thought of a better idea than you, and it's like, man, why didn't I think of that? That's so cool. Yeah, and, and right uh, away, me and Jay, because uh, he didn't know this existed, and I only I only found out, I think, last year, um, for people, normally when we're putting racks in for businesses, we're not thinking about the noise factor. That's why they call it the wiring closet or the server room. That's that noisy place where all this stuff goes. And uh, so I think we'll actually start out mentioning uh, enclosures. Now, yep. if the uh, I, I think one of the fun things I, I love seeing in Home Lab, and don't get me... Um, I'm not going to say this is something we'd ever install in a business, but I think it's clever. There is IKEA hacks, and it's taking IKEA stuff that measures the same width as server distances, and there's a handful of different tables. I think that's cool, but we're not going to dive into that today. But I, I have no problem at all. Anyone who builds their home lab based on IKEA furniture, I think that's pretty cool. I just won't. I can't install it out of customers. We're we are going to keep this a little bit more towards stuff you can buy, stuff that's made for actual server rooms. Right. But I want to start out with a 12U enclosure server cabinet made by StarTech. That's called the um does it have an actual name or is it just 12U quiet rack? We will start doing some show notes and leave links so you can find these things. But this is kind of a neat feature that um I mentioned to Jay because uh, he like myself is he's using I have a rack in my studio, so I can't have noisy things in there, and Jay right. doesn't want noisy things in his. So they actually make these 12U enclosures by Start uh, StarTech. They might make some uh, different size ones as well, but they're made specifically with sound insulation in them. So they're kind of a neat – they are not budget-friendly. Um, I'll admit right. I'm looking at this thing right. to cost right around $1,400. Uh, yep. So yep. this is not your cheap option for starting your home lab. But I want to mention for those of you that do have a budget for this, it's a neat idea because it's a complete sound encapsulation type of rack. Um, it's it's worth noting on something like that. So if you've got the budget and you want it in your close proximity, but you uh, have a noise pollution problem with it, this is uh, definitely an idea. I'd actually tweeted out about one of my staff who was uh, his TrueNAS system. He had to upgrade with some Be Quiet fans because noise pollution in his uh, home office was a little bit of an, an issue. So this, this does come up... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, from yeah, time to time. It does. So a little bit of background. Um, if, if you are on the live stream or if you've seen any of my videos in the past year or so, you see the server rack behind me. And for those of you that are listening on the podcast audio version, um, you know, behind me is a black server rack that looks like it's enclosed because it has a glass front panel, but it's not. I'm a bonehead. I, you know, I'm a hypocrite. I always tell everyone, you know, read carefully, make sure it's the right fit. And I impulsively bought it without any research at all, I'll admit. And what I found out was I'm like, oops, this is a network um, cabinet, not a server cabinet. So it looks fully enclosed. And people will ask me, uh, what rack are you using? I want one like that. No, I don't even tell people wh what it is because I don't want anyone to buy it. It's not for that. It's for switches. So the back of it is completely open. And it's kind of loud, but no one hears it because I have filters. So that kind of cancel that out. And then I look at my desk the other day and it's starting to kind of bend downward. So now I have some decisions to make, hence the conversation 
Tom and I are having. And then we're like, yeah, I think we should, or Tom was like, yeah, we should probably talk about the rack part of it because you got to have something to put your stuff into. Yeah. Now there's, this is all talking about some enclosed. And Jay has a, like you said, not the right depth one, but it is, it does create an enclosed rack. Uh, you can get some what are a whole lot cheaper, of course. You can start with your two post rack. You can start with your four post rack. The two post one are cool if you've got a basement, but you have to secure the base. And a lot of servers actually support kind of mid mount and you can balance them in there. It's not the best idea, but we are, I would try to be as budget conscious. Uh, as possible with a lot of the home map people as you're getting started on there. The best news is if you can find a local recycler, you will find these things thrown out all the time. You can check Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, Offer Up. Those are common ones, at least here in the United States, where you'll find a lot of these. And if you keep an eye out for one, you'll find someone going, can you get this thing out of my building? And you can sometimes get it for next to nothing um, or sometimes just for the pickup. Uh, depending on where it's at. So that's, there's definitely some different opportunities in there, but if you are looking for a few of them, we will leave some links in the show notes for some of the ones you can purchase new, which are still reasonably priced. Um, we actually have built a lot of the 25U racks with the rollers on them. That's what, even what I just put in my basement. I don't have much in my basement, but it's more future thinking if I did. It's the one I have in my studio is a 25U, and it's where we mount everything for the studio demos when I'm doing videos in there. Same thing, it's a 25U four post open. Doesn't do anything for sound deadening, but having everything rack mounted is really nice. Now, let's move a little bit over to the wiring side of things yep. because that's where if, if, if some people will just run the wires and just plug them right into the switch. And that's fine until you want to get things a little bit more advanced or you want to get into the way it's actually done in a more enterprise environment, which I think is a huge learning the physical part of how that's set up and why you set it up that way is big. And I'm going to say in those cases, you can start with, and you can physically put this in your closet and separate from your server case, but this is where your, all your punch downs are going to go. And I'm a big fan of, and I've used a lot of the Cable Matters ones. There's some other ones out there. Cable Matters, I think, is really nice. They're easily found on eBay for reasonable prices. And Cable Matters makes a modular 24-port Keystones type of punch panel. So what the Keystones are is when you're running the different cable, you're going to punch them down into that, and that creates a really nice, clean look. If you go to uh, Reddit or Cable Porn, you'll see all these people talking about it, and you'll see everything mounted up with these Keystones. Now, you can do those separate where you put them physically in your closet, like at, at a home or something like that, and you run all of your wires that are coming from around the house, and that's a good place to punch them down. And you can get one of those units, and actually that's what the rack that's behind Jay in many of his videos, that's more what that's designed for, is to put some smaller switches, always before you get one of those, measure the depth to make sure they work. But um, even if you get a really shallow one or a little tiny one, uh, there's a lot of options if you look there are ways to mount switches. So instead of going uh, vertically, they flip, they, they, they go long side down. You can actually do, and we've done some clean installs for clients that don't have any on-prem servers. We've turned the switches the other way. You can actually turn the switches and a punch down so they're actually facing up and the bottom of the switch, well, the back of the switch is actually facing straight down. If you can picture that, that's another way you can mount them when you're space constrained. Um, and we do this in small medical offices and things like that, because a lot of them don't have any on-prem server equipment, and it becomes a really nice, clean install. And then you can just run one wire over to your server rack where all the other equipment is, so you don't have to necessarily run, if you've got 10 cables around your house for cameras, for Wi-Fi, or you know, wiring up the other rooms. When you punch them all down, you can keep it pretty clean like that. How are yours done, Jay? Not like that. Uh, not the way it should be. Um, I'm doing it the first way you mentioned, where I just have the cables ran. It's something on my list to do to get an actual patch panel. Um, there's another side of my network you don't see in here. So I have a separate fully enclosed, well, it's not fully enclosed. There's, it's got holes in it, but it, it's an enclosed little rack that houses my main switch, the cable modem, the UPS for the internet gear. Um, so that's just all the boring stuff that people in the video, you know, videos don't really care about. And it's in another room and it's just, it just the cables come, you know, through the wall down into the back of it. And I just plug it straight into the switch. So eventually I do plan on doing a, an actual patch panel. It's just one of the things on my list of, you know, stuff to do that I never get to, but I, I will someday. Yeah. Yeah. It's um getting 
it, it's best if you can do this when you start. A lot of people, because it becomes that much more of a task when you put it off. This is this is where you see Reddit R cable fail. <laughs> and that's how you're like, how did it get this way? Well, it started as a small problem no one wanted to deal with. Uh, 40 more wires were added. So now it's a 40 more wire problem that no one wants to deal with. Another right. side note to the, um, when you're using the modular ones too, is especially in a home environment, you can get HDMI jacks, for example, and you can run some of the other non necessarily network thing into those uh, type of uh, keystone jacks. They're they're very flexible like that. And I commented, I had a recent video, and I can leave a link to that in the show notes, where I discuss some of the other options, including USB. If uh, they actually have, for example, and because I'm like looking right now at Jay in the video, if you're looking, or as Jay said in his videos, where he's got that rack behind him, if you have a server and you have USBs on the back of the server and you have a patch panel above the server, you can actually get a kit so you can extend the USBs off the back of the server and bring them to the keystones. And then when you open up the rack door, you can actually plug things directly in in case the, there's not very many USBs available on the front of the server and you have a need to get to them. You can actually extend the back ones out there. There's a lot of cool things you can do once you get into the modular keystones while mm -hmm. also keeping it very, very clean. Um, I'm going to be doing some videos soon exactly how to clean up the cabling. There's a couple of methodologies where you pull the cables through, trim them off, pull them back, and uh, snap the keystones on and snap them in. You want that really universal look. There's a few instructions out there. I haven't done a detailed video, but you can always see the end result. It, it gives it such a nice look. And also, please never use zip ties, especially in a home lab. I always go Velcro because you'll change things a lot. And Velcro is nice. It slides off real easy. It's satisfying sound it makes when it pulls apart. I and love and... Velcro. I, I call them zip ties, but they're not. Um, yeah. The Velcro ties. But as an aside, like I can, I can um, greatly enhance the importance of this by mentioning I found out really uh, the hard way why you should not use the actual zip ties because I'm lucky I'm still alive, actually, because... Earlier in my career, and I'm talking, you know, when I was just help desk level, so just kind of starting out, I go to the shop floor because the build, the company I worked for had an office side and then a, a shop side, or like a factory, and all the guys there zip tied everything and everything. They were just zip tie happy. I, I'd never seen anything like it. Like the guy asked for a um, replacement keyboard. So, you know, I grab a keyboard, I have like 30 of them, and I get to his desk and he has the keyboard cable zip tied to all the other cables around the desk so one by one i get a utility knife which is the worst thing you can do by the way and i'm just sawing at each one and i keep going then i slip and my hand goes into the power cord for the computer with a metal utility knife i slip oh. right into it now obviously it's not the zip tie's fault because um you know i'm a klutz but um velcro is so much easier just just on just unwrap it and you're done um and after that day i have never bought the uh, plastic zip ties again considering how accident prone i actually am so um i felt electricity in my body and i could not talk i could not move um and i it was just bad so <laughs> don't use plastic zip ties ever that's that's my opinion anyway but maybe i'm a little biased now after that incident to be fair yeah, it, it's one of those things. Once you've worked with a lot of uh, network cabling or cable cleanup jobs, especially, um, there's two different types of the, there's the pull-through zip ties that are usually you can buy in a bulk package and each one's exactly the same length and has a little hole trimmed in it. So they wrap around the cable and pull through. Those are really nice. The other thing we use too is you can buy bulk uh, spools of it that have a trim off and one side has the um, you know, adheres to the other side. Those are great too, because then you just trim them to length. You just roll it around something real quick and trim, roll it around, trim. So you'll actually do bundles of cables and you just quickly wrap them real quick, trim it real quick, done. And those are, they're yep. still reusable. They're still Velcro. So there's a lot of, it, trust me, when you want to be able to have your lab be flexible um, and still look nice. And there's something to be said for it looking nice. I, I I have seen a lot of people say, I don't have time for cable management, but I will. I feel better about it. I know there are differing opinions that some uh, people have on this. My Mine is always of my cables have to be managed. <laughs> That's... <laughs> cables in general like um if anyone goes online and looks at a picture of my office i mean i still have some work to do but you'll you know, you'll notice that my monitor and, and for those of you listening to to the audio um my monitor is actually on the wall so i'm you know the video people you know that one right there yep 
it's on the wall and you, you won't see any cables because I bought a kit where I actually cut a hole in the drywall and there's a, a fixture that you put in there, runs the cables through the wall and you won't even see them. And it, it's got an easy access thing where I can you know pull cables down if I need to. But cable management is like the bane of my existence and it's not even limited to home lab. Like just the other day, I'm rearranging the cables to my retro gaming side of the toughest and I have like eight or nine consoles on there. Oh my gosh, it was the worst thing ever to manage those cables. So that's why I have a lot of respect for people that could do it well. Like you, Tom, you do it better than I do for sure. I've seen your pictures on your uh, Twitter. So um, I'm trying to get to that level, I think. Yeah, it's... It takes time. It's also experience doing it. And if you started out, though, you are you would be better if you work towards that goal from the, the get-go. Now, right. um, I've seen in the comments uh, here in the live stream, one of the things that I, is definitely worth mentioning is getting, uh, like, the vented trays. Uh, this, I, they're usually called, like, the StarTech makes a 2U vented server rack mount tray. The tray is great uh, when you put them in a rack and they sell them in different depths because the cable modem, uh, which is going to be probably the more frequently, or you know, even even if it's not cable modem, however your internet provider provides you some type of on-prem equipment, very frequently that, that on-prem equipment is not rack mounted. Right. And uh, that's where the tray, they usually sell some short depth trays you can mount. They mount the same way to the rack and they are really handy. We usually set everything on there. I say vented ones specifically though, I prefer those because one of the things we'll do is run the little Velcro through the holes in the vents and hold all the wires down so everything stays nice and neat in there. It makes it a little bit nicer. Um, not to the detriment, so to speak, of being able to slide it out. So you want to make sure the wires aren't everywhere, but we'll take like the power supply and just run one of those Velcros around it through the vent holes. Just so everything's got this kind of nice, clean, I know where everything is, nothing's going to fall off. And more importantly, if someone pulls a wire a little bit, it won't slide the wire and unpower a device that might be sitting on those trays. So that's kind of a good other way to help hold that all together. I think it also is a good idea to buy the right length of network cables instead of just buying like a, you know, 20 units of, uh, you know, 10 foot cable, you know, that's already done. If you're going to buy a cable and you're not, you know, cutting the cable yourself, if you can learn how to cut your own cable and, and do the ends, that's even better. At the very least, if you're not going to do that, it, it, you know, if you only have like two feet to go, don't buy a 10 foot cable for that, you know. Um, you could, you could, you basically will end up with a really clean looking server rack in the front. But then when you look around the back, you see this wad of excess cable that you didn't know what to do with. Yep. Um, it's never a good thing either. So just buy what you need. And power cords too, a lot of people don't realize this, but the server power cords you could buy in different sizes as well. So if you only, if you have like a PDU in your server rack and you only need to go like a short distance from the power of the server to that PDU, you don't need a five foot power cable for that. You could buy a smaller one. And when you do things like that, you won't really have to do cable management as much because it kind of does it itself because the cables are the exact length that you need. And that could really help too. Yeah, so one of the things in, you mentioned like PDU or power distribution unit, um, there's a crossover, it turns out, in the audio market. So people who use professional DJ equipment actually have a lot of the same stuff. So you you can use, and I've recommended before, and I have these, uh, like I said, this will be links in the show notes so you can see the exact models. Um, but there are some of them that have nice switches on the front. And yep. I, server people panicked. They're like, what do you mean you would put power switches on the front so someone could just turn things off? I'm like, no, no, from a home lab perspective, I have all of them labeled so I know what I'm turning off. That way, if I got to power something down or something and whatnot, you can put them right on the front. You could also, uh, if you bought one of those open post racks, you could put them on the back side. And that's actually where I have mine mounted at home. It's on the flip side of it. So if I need to power off something or make sure something's powered on, I can just flip switches on it. So those are yeah. um, another, another little detail on there. Uh, I to bought make sure one it's... last week, believe it or not. Like you mentioned it, like, like, um, and you and I haven't even talked about this because it's not even server related, but I bought one because I manage like a, a large number of video game consoles from the 90s and, and, and up on one TV. And the vampire power from all the standby power from each of those is, is hard. So I actually bought exactly that. It's made for audio people, but I just, you know, I labeled each switch. This is the Super Nintendo. This is the Nintendo. Yep. And then... In the back, I bought these one foot or no, I think they're like three or four inch um, power cord extenders because, you know, we have these wall warts, right? Yeah. And everything I'm mentioning is is good for home lab people, too, because you could have these big power adapters. You don't want to hang a big power adapter off the you know side of your uh, PDU. 
you could just buy this little extender and plug it in and then um, it makes it a lot easier to manage you don't have one power brick blocking another outlet uh, which is often something that happens and then um when you mentioned powering things off i i fully support that i think that's something a lot of people don't realize if you know you're in a home lab unless you're running your company out of a home lab chances are you sleep right and there's there's probably not people that in your house that are awake all night turn it off cut the power to it um there's nothing wrong with that because why pay for any amount of power if you're not actually using it unless you have backups running all night um maybe you have a backup night where everything sinks or something like that yeah cut it off that's fine uh you'll save some money yep now one final thing, and then we're going to move on to the cabling side of things, uh, as I know people, that's one of them that I know there's going to be a lot of questions, a lot of discussion. But when it comes to uh, the mounting things in the rack, we did some review of rack studs. And I'm actually so shocked, uh, I'm just really surprised how well they held up. We did some stress testing with them. We were we were laying weights after weights on there. So I have a whole video on what it took to, to break the rack studs. And we weren't testing the shear. We were testing, I think it's the tinsel strength. It was a stretch. I'm not a, I'm not a structural engineer, but either way, take it for what it's worth. We put some seriously heavy weights on things. Like literally one of my staff brought their weights in and we set all the weights from his lift lifting stuff on there. And uh, once we got all that on there, it, it held up amazingly well. So rack studs are cool. And what the rack studs allow you to do is pop them all in there. And when you want to slide something in and out of the rack to change it, no screwdriver necessary. They're all thumb screws and they actually hold really, really well. Um, this is particularly handy, like when you, you know, especially when you're doing tech, uh, testing of equipment, uh, swapping those things around, this happens to be quite a bit of it. Um, now let's talk about cabling because boy, yeah. that's a long what, one. Yeah, this, this is, a, is a long one. Now patch cables, you're right. Buy the length you need because um, you want to patch it from where you put the punch downs over to the switch. And those are easier bought pre-made. They're also well bought if you take and uh, want some of the thin ones. There's a couple of those. I'll leave links to all the different uh, ones out there. And you probably don't need the boots, but the thin ones are nice. But the thin ones do have a limit when it comes to some of the PoE. So take that for what it's worth on where you're using those. The cable itself, though, the most frequent question that comes up to us uh, when it comes to people contacting is people are always like, hey, I'd like to wire up my new house that I'm building or new building. I want to future proof it. Should I just run fiber everywhere? That is absolutely probably not a great idea. Um, there's going to be someone who's going to disagree with me. There's going to be someone who says, well, fiber is uh, faster, et cetera, et cetera, but it's not easy to work with is the first problem. It does not work very well in the adapters are not universally as acceptive as the standard RJ45 type plug. So it's pretty much even here in 2021, despite fiber having been around for like ever, at least 20 plus years, uh, you still want to run standard copper cabling. Now, right, well, let's get, yeah. Now the type of cabling, Cat5 is actually, I, I have a video I did called out of spec. You can do things a bit out of spec. And if you have Cat5, you'd be shocked to learn it probably, not guarantee, it will not certify with a cable certifier, of course, but it will probably have no problem running at 10 gig. You are actually listening to this podcast with a computer that I'm using connected at 10 gig using Cat5. It goes about 20 feet down the hall to my 10 gig switch. <laughs> so <laughs> the... Definitely do it. Yeah. Should yeah you you can, can get away with it. So if you have Cat5 and you're going, do I need to replace this to get uh, faster speeds in my house? You can probably get away with, if they're short distances, it might work. It's not a guarantee, but try it. Um, the same thing goes with, like, I seen someone right away in the comments said, what about Cat8? And Cat8's not worth it either. Yeah, Cat8 is um, not really future-proofing, and it's a little bit kind of high-priced. Right now, what you want to think about is, do you need Cat6 or Cat6A? Cat6 goes 10 gig, no problem, but over short distances. But those distances are probably more related to how far you can go in a house. If you look at something like Cat6A, Cat6A will go much longer distance and will maintain 10 gig. So you kind of, it's not like you're going to get anything better. And 10 gig is 10 gig, by the way. These are digital signals. This is not like there's a difference. Like if I took a piece of Cat6A at 20 feet and a piece of Cat6 at 20 feet, they connect to 10 gig. You don't get a better transfer out of either one of them. They connect at 10 gig 
that's it. They don't go faster. <laughs> it's a digital signal. Right. Yep. And and I mean, future proofing only goes so far because I mean, you can make the argument that cabling doesn't change nearly as fast as the IT industry in general. But it's kind of funny when people say future proofing and they're talking about technology, because for all we know, like something could come out tomorrow that's going to totally throw everything um, upside down. Um, you know, stranger things have happened. Um, you can only do so much. Um, you're trying to eliminate any possibility you're going to have to pull the cables out and rerun them. I don't want to do that either, but um, just go with the best possible solution that's available today and, and don't worry so much about what might happen in 10 years. I mean, you might even sell your house in six years. Who knows, right? So it just depends on the situation. Yeah. So the one thing is when you go to the CAT, um, and you just, if you want to run CAT 6A, the next thing people seem to tell me, and I don't know where they get this information from, so it's pretty well documented in the spec. Um, you do not need to get shielded unless you're experiencing some interference in there. So for the most part, you can get away without it being uh, shielded. You can just get the basic stuff. They sell this at most of your local hardware stores like Home Depot and Lowe's here in America has it. It's not that hard to obtain, but Big warning right here. Make sure if you see a box that seems suspiciously less money when you're buying cable, you be very aware of why it's less money. It's called yep. copper clad aluminum. And if you see what they've done is they take aluminum and they coat it with copper, which of course, aluminum is cheaper than copper. And people end up going, hey, I have all kinds of problems with this. I'm like, yes, that cable is very low quality. You want a pure copper cable. It does save you some money, but it may not save you the headache of it. And I've not heard good things about those. Um, I'm fuzzy on how well tested that is. I've heard a lot of people tell me a lot of bad things about it. We never tried it, never used it. Um, I just know from other technicians and because I was really curious myself when I seen when years ago when it started popping up on the market, I'm like, why is this box so much cheaper than the other boxes? Um, yeah. Especially about 10 years ago when scrap metal prices got a little bit exuberant, um, cable prices were unfortunately affected by that. So it was hard to find good deals on cable. And that's when that came into the market. And I'm like, what's the, what's the catch? This You didn't suddenly magically make the price of copper drop. Oh, you're just using less copper. <laughs> I experienced that myself, actually. I, I, I think I remember going to Home Depot or Lowe's. I can't remember. I want to say... It was about $100 or something, which is fine. Um, but then a local computer store near the company where I was working, I think it was $30 for 1,000 feet versus like 100 or something like that. Um, so I bought the cheaper one. And then at that, that was way back when I first learned how to crimp the network cables. And I was proud of myself. I learned how to do it. I could attach a cable tester. It passed the test. So I, I felt like I knew what I was doing. I could get it perfect every single time. But then later on, the cables would just stop working. Like they would just start having errors. And I'm like, what's going on here? I'd, and it would fail a test. Like I'd attach a tester to it, a known good cable that passed the test before failed the test now. And I had to rerun the cable again. And at first I'm like, yeah, that's just a one-off, no problem. And then another one, and then another one, and then another one. And then it got to the point where I had to rerun a cable every um, other month. And I'm like, what is going on? Um, but better quality cable, um, I mean, it, it goes without saying, spend the extra money. Um, that I don't know what I bought or what kind it was. I know it was Cat 5e that I do know, but that's what they told me. But it, it, you said headache? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think you remember me ca calling you up a long time ago. My access points aren't working right. And then after a month of fighting it, I'm like, oh, the cable's bad. You know, just get yep. good cable. I, and it's funny, I've seen in the comments in the live stream here, uh, this is a myth I've seen uh, come up quite a bit. Can cables be too short? And I'm uh, one of my friends, and maybe I'll get him on a channel sometime. He gave me the history of this. And it came, he, he told me he's been a Cisco guy since the earliest days of Cisco. And he told me it was, um, according to him at least, the, this was propagated by a bunch of Cisco engineers that used to say there was a minimum length that you had to have for a patch cable mm -hmm. to work. and he never understood why electrically because he's a pretty smart guy and he says he never understood it. He used to argue with him and that's all been scrubbed. Like they don't say that anymore, but he goes, that was perpetuated by a lot of different sales engineers that there was a minimum length for patch cable. There is not as short as will fit is perfectly fine. There's not a too short of a length 
um, the theory was, at least per, this myth perpetuated by the sales engineers, as, as legend goes, was that if you had it, if you got two switches too close together or a device too close together with it, it wouldn't uh, do some, there wasn't enough twist to make it actually work. Um, that's now yeah. the twists do cancel out the noise and I won't dive too deep into that rabbit hole because it's not where I'm an expert, but I will. And this is something I make sure I leave both of these links in here. If you want to dive deep into cable standards, um, because I didn't, because I'm not an expert, I had an expert guest come on my uh, channel and me and Dan Barrera, who literally works on the standards committee, he's among the people that certified cat seven and cat eight to exist. So he, He's he's an engineer by trade, uh, so he, when he reviews cabling standards presented by companies, he tests them for the engineering and making sure that the signal ratios. And we dive all over the place. It's a it's there's two different episodes I have with him. It is wonderful. I rewatched him myself to pick up because mostly he talks, not me, because he is really smart at this stuff. <laughs> so, so if you ever want to dive into the, how electrically all of this functions, it's great. Definitely, yeah. definitely a rabbit hole you can go into. It, it is. Um, it, but to me, it's when people tell me I'm wrong about something. I'm like, oh, no, I remember what he said in, in the podcast or episode where I recorded with him. So I just, I just sent him a link. I said, I'm not an expert on this, but this guy literally sets the standards. So argue with his answers. As a matter of fact, he replies to a lot of people's comments. <laughs> That's really awesome. So I think one thing we probably should talk about, but I don't think either one of us wants to talk about this, but I think it's something we kind of have to, and that's power line networking. Um, it's like, oh God, that really, do we have to? Um, because <sighs> you know, it's just one of those things where the idea is great. You could just magically transport um, you know, over power lines. And one thing I, I do understand, and this is gonna be a common thread, I think, there's gonna be a lot of people out there that they rent their house, they don't own it, so they can't really modify it. And then their options are either go all wireless if they can, if they don't have crazy things in the walls that block the signal. But then sometimes there's a viable um, thing for a reason for power line. And I'll give you one edge case that was really, really weird. Um, my son's PS4 stopped connecting via Wi-Fi. And at the time I assumed that the Wi-Fi card was toast. And um, that was back when we were renting. So I, I ran Powerline uh, for that, and it worked for him. I later found out that Unify had a weird update that broke PS4 compatibility. And as soon mm. as they patched it, then his Wi-Fi card magically started working again. But also, you know, renting, it, it's hard to make modifications, especially if you want to keep your security deposit. So um, for me personally, now we own this house. So it's like, I feel like I'm just, it's just, being in awe of the fact that I can do stuff. I could run cable. I can have actual jacks and do it the right way. It's a great feeling. But until you get to that point, um, Powerline is one of those things where they'll advertise a crazy fast speed. The one I have that I don't use now was like 2000 megabits or something like that. You, you, you'll never get that from there, but that's what they advertise. And I think we got like 150 to 200 so yeah. it's one of those things that's like um, you, you're just allowing a bunch of errors. It's like you're throwing a ball at a target and you're going to hit it one out of 100 times, right? Um, if you keep throwing it in that general direction, that seems to be kind of how the signal is. It's just um, we, due to the errors, you're not going to get the full speed, but it is what it is. What do you think on that? You know, I, I've heard a lot of people complain about them. And it seems to vary from environments, but the, my, the overall verdict is they're not wonderful. And right. it's, but it's a challenge. If you are leasing a place, renting a place, you're unable to modify the structure of where you live in any way. The options really come down to, and someone actually messaged, and I think it was in my forums, and I thought this was a clever solution. Um, they grabbed, because they had them, a couple site-to-site -site devices and pointed them at each other from the basement to the upstairs. And that's how they got the internet working because it it, it will travel not a guaranteed to work it depends on the the structure inside your house a lot but they were able to get two site to sites to link inside their house and i thought that was a funny way to fix networking issues when you want to get it from one place to another so that one uh that one made me laugh uh, but clever it, solutions. yeah yeah 
Um, the power line one, I don't know if there's enough demand to make that technology better. It seems to be hit and miss. I debated about buying a couple to see if there's a, if it's a brand because people seem to complain about them. And we have actually, you know, we see a lot of people asking about cabling to solve the problem, but I don't know enough about the brands to have um, a clear knowledge of is one brand better than the other or is right. it a scenario-based problem where the way the wiring is, if, it is, if it's too many plugs away, does it not work? But if it's on the same circuit does it work better there, there's a lot of analysis that i don't know but it's it's also something especially if you're leasing a place you may not know as much about the wiring because you don't have a map of it and you may not have any options to change it so it's one of those plug it in see if it works maybe you'll get a good connection maybe you won't it's a gamble i don't i don't those are last resort in my opinion it is last resort i, I think i might i have a theory on why they don't make them better and that theory is if you have, let's say, a, a 2000 megabit um, version, which of course you're not going to get that. But you're you're going to get maybe 200, let's just say hypothetically. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people out there, they don't even have a 200 megabit internet connection. Now, granted, nowadays that's more likely to happen. But when I first bought this one, that was less likely. So the argument can be made, and this could also be made in, in, in your house, if your internet connection is 75 megabits, then 200 megabits, even though it's not the advertised 2000, it's fine. You're, you're still able to get the internet speed that you're paying for through that. Um, obviously for home labbers, a problem comes in where you want to migrate a VM from one Foxbox node to another. And now all of a sudden that 200 megabits, that's going to be very painful, especially if you're doing large file transfers, you're going to really notice it then. But for people that you know, aren't doing things like that. If they have an internet connection, 100 megabit, whatever it is, um, that, you know, kind of not that great power line adapters, probably perfectly fine for them. Um, I think in order for that to get better, us, you know, home lab people are going to have to put pressure on them. Hey, we matter too. We want to send large files from one end to the other. We, we actually do that kind of thing. But they're going to make the assumption as a business case that, you know, you have 802.11 AC, which is going to be orders of magnitude faster than that. So if you want to, if, you know, you don't want to run cable, you could just run through wi Wi-Fi, even though we'll argue that's still not the greatest. Wired is always better. But from the, uh, from the mindset of the manufacturers, they probably think that way. It, there has to be a big use case for them to, to think if there's only like a couple, you know, maybe 10,000 people that care. Um, I'm not saying that's the number. That could be a problem. Now that's just a guess. But I think the point though is if you are only concerned with getting the internet to a desktop in another room and your internet connection is slower than the max speed you get off the power line, there's probably no reason not to use it. But when you, you know, want to actually do file transfers, that's you're gonna, yeah, that's not gonna be very, very nice at all. Yeah. Now, um I reading back through the comments, one thing that I didn't mention, but of course I don't know any easy way to say this other than comply with whatever laws are in your area when it comes to doing this. Um, this is something in the business world. I, I am based out of the state of Michigan, just south of Detroit. We don't actually have any specific code rules regarding low voltage cabling, but some other states in the U.S. have very specific where you have to be a licensed installer at all to touch them. I, sometimes they cross over with the they either have a separate one or you need to be an electrician's license. So you do have to be careful to make sure you're complying with whatever laws govern your area when you're putting these in. And a side note of that is whether or not you need to use plenum. Uh, plenum wire is a fire rating for it. I, I had a really interesting debate with someone um, and saved them a fortune because they, they were convinced prior to me proving it to them, they were a uh, chief tech officer for a large company we were doing an install for. They were burying all the cable underground uh, and pouring cement over it all in conduit. It's a really cool setup that we did for them. They wanted to run plenum because they were insistent plenum was faster. And I'm like, that's a burn rating. That's a if, if it runs in the plenum, as in the airspace above your head, there are there are codes in Michigan that say yes. If it's in an open airspace, that airspace is shared with your heat heating cooling system. Um, we have to have a fire and burn rating of uh, these plenum. So they, that is code to use that. But when you're running it underground, 
it, it doesn't really need to be because it's in an enclosed outside of the airspace where it shared that. So we actually saved them a fortune because 99% of their wires were all underneath the buildings <laughs> with part of the build. And uh, But you may have to use that. These are, It always is important to stay in compliance. Now, plenum does have a premium cost attached to it. But a lot of times, it's if you're putting it into walls and things like that, it's just not necessary. That's actually why the other type of cable is called riser. It's for the rise up areas, as in, in the walls and things like that. That's a very good point. Yeah, definitely check your local regulations and uh, yeah, see see what it is. Yeah. So those are little little nuances, details in there. Now, one of the next things to talk about is let's talk about 10 gig and. Yeah. This is where if you're doing it physically locally, and if let's say you're building a stack of servers and you want to use 10 gig, and someone's going to point out we're just not going to get too deep into the rabbit hole. Yes, there are faster than 10 gig speeds, but I think what's the most affordable for the home lab people in terms of switches and in terms of buying cards is definitely 10 gig. The It's been around since I think the standard came out in 2006 for it. It's it's been around long enough that there's numerous iterations that are cheap on eBay, like the Intel uh, 520 cards, and I'll leave some links in the show notes to these. Uh, I think there are the Intel DA520 cards that are SFP, which SFP is for running things in your rack. It's for shorter distance. SFP plus. Make sure we have that labeled right. SFP physically is the same as SFP plus. Electrically, it's different. So those things will slip in there. But if you want to go 10 gig in your servers, you want to make sure it's SFP plus with an SFP plus cable. Or if you're just going server to server, it looks really cool to do fiber. But it's not it's not any faster. It, you, you can just buy the little, they're called DAC, direct attached copper cables. And SFP plus DAC cables and SFP switches, especially... The Mikrotik switches, Mikrotik, hands down, if you are looking for budget 10 gig, that's new, not used on eBay. There's always, that's a different wild card of finding something used. Uh, Mikrotik still has some of the cheapest ones, that little four port Mikrotik. It's like $129 to get four ports of 10 gig. I can't even touch that. Like that's even hard to find used on eBay, <laughs> 10 gig uh, switch, but that's a brand new price for the Mikrotik one, but it's all DAC. It's all direct attached copper, or you can, like I said, put the uh, cop, uh, put the fiber in there if you wanted. But that's a great way if you want your VMs to transfer faster, especially if you want to run 10 gig between your TrueNAS server and your Proxmox, your XCPNG or whatever hypervisor is your preference. That is a great way to do it. You get a couple of these cards, you get one of those, and it does have a standard copper RJ45 on the other side. And that allows you to plug it into the rest of your network. But the servers can happily talk to each other in a budget-friendly way. I'm going to add that to there because so I did see someone at least posted, show me the 40 gig stuff. And I'm like, I, I know, but that's generally goes a little beyond the budget of most of the home lab people. Don't don't get me wrong. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice. So in my case, like um, in my situation, I have one Proxmox server. I used to have two. I'm going to go back to two. I'm not, I decided not to do shared storage. Um, I don't mind waiting longer. Um, the server that I have has NVMe storage on there, so it's pretty fast. So when I'm doing backups to TrueNAS, I'm going to want to have 10 gig just to make the backups happen faster. And if I had a new Proxmox server, which I think I'm going to buy, then even if I'm doing live migration without shared storage, it is just going server to server, which is a lot slower. That would happen a lot quicker with uh, 10 gig. So I think I'm going to be in the market for this. And I'm going to be looking at these links too and, and probably upgrading that because, I mean, normally I don't mind waiting a long time for the, the migrations and the backups and things, but if I can make it quicker and it doesn't cost that much, I may as well, you know, make that faster. Yeah. The, um, those cards, like I said, the Intel ones, you can find those in, in the price range of, I think I bought the last ones brand new. I, they were a box of them on eBay and I bought a few of them. I think they were like $66, $67 each. They were, they were just not that expensive. They were, I got them on a good price. I've seen them go as much as $90, but that's still, they're two port 10 gig. That's plenty, especially if you put them in a lag together. Now you have you know a potentially larger pipeline uh, f for more tasks. Uh, it, it's definitely... It's it's definitely getting uh, much more affordable to do those things. Now, the other thing I want to mention is the 10 gig modules. I've covered a few of those 10 gig modules before. You have to be careful because one of the confusions people get, you can buy 
a switch that has SFP modules cheaper than you can buy a switch that has 10 gig RJ45s. So what people do is they buy a switch and they go, hey, I only need a couple copper RJ45s to go across some distance of my house, maybe back to the garage where you have a server or wherever you might have it. But you have to watch when you use the modules, the modules themselves, even if you run Cat 6A, they don't necessarily go the full distance for that. And um, this is one of those little nuances. You have to make sure you're reading the modules because it's only recently that FS.com, well, I should say in more recent time, um, they, depends on when you're listening to us, came out with modules that support greater than 30 meters. That used to be a limit a lot of the modules had. And this is also what creates some of that confusion for people is they're going, well, I want to do this, but then I realize it's not working and I don't know why. And I'm like, read the details. What part number did you get? And they're like, oh, this doesn't go that distance, but the cabling does. I'm like, yes, the cabling does. Now you got to go buy a more expensive switch. This is some of that nuance, but it's really important to look through these things when you're purchasing these modules. The second thing about these modules is the if Sorry, you buy a you 10 gig, go ahead. You froze for a sec out of the last uh, 15 seconds or so. Ah. Sorry, I didn't notice you might froze too. <clears throat> the, 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 uh, other challenge is if you have one of those Intel cards that I mentioned and you pop in the uh, modules, those modules frequently don't work with a lot of cards. Those cards were meant to support DAC. I found people that think, hey, I can get a budget here. I can get a dual 10 gig card for cheap and I can get a couple of these cheap modules on Amazon and slap them all together. And then they don't link anymore. So it's kind of you got, you got to be careful and make sure all these things are compatible with each other. And I'll leave links to some of the videos where I break some of that down um, to help clear up that confusion around there. Because people start out with some of that budget conscious, think they're kind of a way to get around the system. I'm like, there's there's some things you do have to look at and buy on there. So that you ha it's probably sometimes better to go ahead and uh, spend the extra money, buy the 10 gig switch, and it, it's just going to work better for you. And one of the really popular ones, and actually the one I'm using in my computer, is the Asus makes a uh, 10 gig PCIe card for desktops that's RG45. It's like $89, I think. It's not too expensive. And I've used it for a long time. It's The most frequent question, I've reviewed it before, people say, well, doesn't it overheat? And I'm like, I I've never had a problem with it. I don't know if it was an earlier model design. Mine doesn't get hot. <laughs> so um, it's been working perfectly fine for me. So I, I still think that card's a good purchase here in 2021. And I've had it for a couple of years now. So I'm not sure, I, but I know there was like, if you read the Amazon reviews, people talked about it overheating. I don't know, maybe I have just better air circulation. Uh, it's not been an issue for me. <laughs> oh, I will address um, a tuning issue. If you want to set the MTU to a non-default setting, read the details of every device that's in between to be able to get that to work properly. We have helped a lot of people troubleshoot all the problems they created with MTUs, especially um, with equipment that has nuances in the documentation, like, oh, you don't set it MTU 9000, you had it, you set it 9012 because this model requires 12 extra bits that it carries over. Um, you, it's kind of, that's kind of a fine tuning thing. I don't know that it's as necessary to, uh, do that. I mean, if you're if you're uh, someone who wants to tweak the absolute most speed on your storage network and want to adjust that MTU to a larger chunk size, those larger MTUs don't translate though to any faster internet speeds because they have to be chunked back down at some point to be able to get out to the internet. So really think about your use case for it. Maybe only do it on your storage network, but please note every device you add on there, you also have to add. And we've had people where they have half devices working and half of them have a lot of weird issues. That's because the other ones, they didn't implement properly the MTU 9000. Every device has to match on that segment or it may not work properly and create some very unexpected problems. So think before you do that. It's not terrible to do it, but plan it accordingly is what I should say. So you can save yourself a lot of uh, trouble Googling things on Stack Exchange. <laughs> Yeah, planning is definitely an important thing. I know home lab is exciting. You want to get it going right now. Um, you know, I've often felt that way too, but every time I bought something without planning it, I've always regretted it every single time. And I think I'm so stubborn. I had to learn that lesson probably more times than anyone else, but um, you know, just, just 
research, take your time, and I, I think it'll all work out. Yep. Now, I will mention, because we covered this all the way back in, was it episode three, I think? Yeah, episode three. That's where we talked yeah. about the uh, networking and firewalls. Uh, something I've reviewed since in between that episode and this one is uh, the TP-Link equipment. I would say for Home Lab, uh, from all my testing the last few weeks with TP-Link, I'm overall, I think it, I, I feel comfortable, not over time because it's only been a few weeks, but it seems to be a pretty good budget-friendly and reasonable thing to install in your Home Lab. I bring that up because they make a lot of switches that are easy to manage with their software-defined networking and their they, they so far, I mean, granted, I've only run it for a few weeks, but I got a lot of feedback from people that said they've been running the TP-Link equipment for longer. And it does seem to make a budget-friendly home lab switch equipment and easy to manage at the same time. That's kind of a good thing. They copied, definitely copied off the Unify, man. It's, I've made as many jokes as I can on, on Twitter about it because, boy, it looks a whole lot like the Unify in every way. <laughs> but that made it easy for those of you that have already know the Unify system. If you want to look at that one, you'll be in very familiar territory. <laughs> yep. I, I've used TP-Link in the past, so I've never had any problems. It's been a very long time, so I haven't seen any of their newer um, offerings. But the ones that I did use um, several years ago, they were fine. I, I didn't have any problems. So um, I think it's probably a good thing to consider. Yeah. So they're definitely um, another another one I will add to there. So if you're looking for some of the physical layer switches, I, I definitely, because I think that was the common question we had in episode three was people kept throwing in, uh, in there going, what about TP-Link? What? I'm like, I haven't reviewed it at that time. So. <laughs> yep, it, yep. And there seems to be a natural order of evolution of a home lab for a lot of people, unless you just happen to have fallen into a bunch of money, you don't know what to do with it. So you decide to buy home lab stuff, then great. You could just go right to the enterprise equipment. But for me, you know, it's kind of started with a spare desktop computer that I added another network card to. And then I made that into a router, which was a fun project. And then um, Tom mentioned for about a year about PFSense. And I'm like, fine, I'll try it out. Actually, as your PenguinCon talk, that, yep. that made me consider it. And I installed it. I'm like, wow, I like this a lot. So then I'm running PFSense. And then later on, I buy a PFSense device. But then I get to the point where, okay, I'd really like to do VLANs, but my switch doesn't support that. So I found on eBay some thing that supported VLANs. It was a horrible interface, but whatever. I got it working. And then I bought wireless access points that support VLANs and you know, thought that stuff used and then over time just keep upgrading. And then next thing you know, I have Unify, I have like, you know, proper PFSense devices. I think um, you start with using what you have and you keep building on that. Um, and, and sometimes that'll go a long way too. Yes. Now, one thing of note, this is um, a frequent thing. And, you know, we do some consulting for people who want to hire us for home lab consulting too. And we yep. constantly have to remind them when they start having VLAN issues, like how many switches do you have? So she wouldn't have a mixed environment. Like Jay said, you bought this one mm -hmm. or bought that one. You have to have switches that support VLANs in order for the VLANs to work. And what right. I mean by that is there's sometimes the assumption made if I have a switch that supports VLAN, let's say like a Unify or a TP-Link switch and you create those VLANs, but then you have this little five port switch that you stuck in between and that's some unmanaged five port. And then you connect it to another switch that supports VLANs or you plug in your Wi-Fi unit to it. It is, there's an extra packet. There's extra pieces of the way that's transmitted for the VLAN. It's part of the... Uh, TCP IP stack is, is within there. You look at all in there, you're like, okay, the way this is transmitted, the way it is transmitted through the switch does have the extra information in there. If it is not part of it or it is stripped off because this that particular switch does not support it, it will strip off those bits that are needed for the VLANs and the tags will not forward to the next uh, switch. We actually have dealt with this in the enterprise environment quite a bit where we found hidden switches and ceilings because someone had an idea and <laughs> we, we couldn't figure out why the VLANs weren't going to where they would, yeah. or we had the mystery of all these different computers showing up on one switch port. We're like, I don't understand how four computers can have one switch port. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's another switch. <laughs> we, we don't know where it leaves the wiring room. And we, we would find them. We had a school that it took us, it took us a long time to finally get all the switches that were behind us that were pushed against walls, ceiling mounted switches and things like that. You'd Sometimes you could find the cord, they had power cords in the ceiling. So 
we couldn't see where they were plugged in. <laughs> yeah, and I've had similar experiences that I've run into. I, I think the logical question at this point is, why should I have VLANs? What's the benefit? And is it something I should do? I, I think there's probably a certain subset of the audience that are probably thinking that right now, like this yeah. is something they should do or not. And I can kind of give you some of my reasons for doing VLANs. Um, the first reason was not practical at all. I just wanted to learn VLANs. I just wanted to VLAN all the things so I could learn it. That's how I do everything. I didn't even have a use case for it to admit to uh, first. It was just, I want to do VLANs. I want to learn it. So I think a lot of people doing home lab, they do things for no other reason than they just want to learn the thing. So they'll implement the thing. But then after I implemented it, I saw a lot of different um, really good use cases for it. So um, and this bit me the other day, but one, one example is I have a VLAN that's my Internet of Things VLAN. And I, I, do, I just don't want those devices to just have free reign to talk to any other device on my, in my home lab. I, I just want them to get to the Internet. That's it. Um, an edge case there is my home assistant. I need to access that to manage my Internet of Things. So I could allow that one, that one device to talk to other devices via firewall rules, but everything else on that VLAN network can only get to the internet. And then I also put a bandwidth cap on there too, because I don't want anything on the internet of things, you know, thing that just saturate my entire internet connection or anything. Um, now, of course, you have to remember what you've implemented because I'm like, why is my home assistant so slow and my cameras are slow? And then I'm like, oh yeah, I put on a bandwidth limit. And since then I've implemented two more cameras. So the bandwidth requirements went up and it took me a week to remember that. That aside, um, that's one use use case for. Sorry, allergies. <laughs> but that's one use case for um, for that is just kind of to segregate things. I think that's a very um, uh, good reason for that. Another one is sync thing for me personally. When I set up a new computer, and yeah, in sync thing itself, you could set some limits there, but. I, I just didn't want anything on my, you know, devices network, which is just laptops and desktops, other than things that are wired in. So we're talking wireless to all of a sudden saturate everything because I, you know, created a new laptop installation and now it's pulling down 300 gigs of data. No one else in the network can download anything because, you know, it's just completely saturated it. So I could put a bandwidth limit on my Wi-Fi that's like 100 megs or something like that. My desktop is wired in. So if I need to transfer a large video file when I do a recording, there's no limitation there, but it can prevent the Wi-Fi equipment from getting saturated or, or my kids are on their own VLAN. So if they're playing an online game, you know, I, I have like, I want to say 50 megabits or something limited there. So if they reformat their computer and download all their Steam games again, um, yeah, they'll have to wait a little bit longer because I have a business network that really needs that bandwidth. So you could segregate things however it makes sense for you. Obviously, if you are just one person in an apartment, probably don't have as much of a use case, especially if you're not using IoT, but um, I think each listener has his or her own reason for um, considering VLANs. And it's not more or less um, what VLANs can do for you. What can you do with VLANs, right? Because you'll yeah. come up with some clever ideas of how to segregate things. And one thing that I, I did recently was I really hated the fact that my smart TV was showing ads. And I wanted to disable its ability to um, show ads. So I figured I was going to just disconnect it from the network and just make it a dumb box. But then I want Home Assistant to be able to reach it so I can automate turning it on or off with, with all the other things. So, um, and I didn't think of this. I think it was a listener that mentioned this. Like, yeah, just put a firewall rule where it blocks the internet. I'm like, why didn't I think of that? That's what I always do. But now I have a smart TV that I can reach on the LAN, but the smart TV itself has no ability to go out and download things that I don't want it to download, especially considering that my streaming media device is not that, I use a Roku. So I segregate that too. So there's all kinds of clever things that you could do with uh, VLAN. So just think about what are some of the pain points on your network and is there any way that, you, that VLANs might work for you? And, and it's possible it could be a solution. Yeah, the, the nice thing about it too is be, you're 
able to run one cable from one location to the other and then split it all off or give the option when you have the switch program that way you know your firewall feeds the switch and then you can trunk each port to only be the output of that one particular network and it just makes it really convenient and this is where companies and like i said it was copied by really well copied by uh the folks at tp link but unify popularized a really simplistic interface because I'm going to say uh, compared to some of the enterprise equipment, Unify did a nice job of making VLANs easier, uh, I would say, and more accessible without having to learn the command line. Because if you started out with Cisco, some of the Cisco people don't like it because it's like, oh, it shouldn't be this easy and they are not using the terminology the same and Cisco does not have the easiest way. And like Jay mentioned before, a lot of the other switches across brands there's not an absolute consistent way they present either a web interface or a command line interface cisco has their way of doing it it's a little bit different if you're using some of the hp pro curve it's a little bit different again if you're using some of the vios or brocade or you insert all these different options uh for out there so uh, but it, once you kind of get it all consolidated boy is it it makes your life a lot easier now of note you are sharing a medium so if I have a one gig connection, all those VLANs are encapsulated within that physical one gig cable, but that means no one particular network device can have more than one gig. Uh, and two devices, even if they're on separate VLANs, they are also limited back to that. So it's just a little bit of a design consideration. Uh, sometimes you may refer to it as the backhaul. When we're designing enterprise networks for companies, for example, we built a warehouse for a client. They have a shipping department way far away at the front of, or the back of the building from the front. So we have a 10 gig pipe that trunks all the VLANs down there because they have cameras, they have separate devices that are all in the shipping warehouse and the computers need to be on one network, the cameras on another, and they have a couple other uh, different devices that have to be on different networks. So you trunk a whole 10 gig pipe down there and then we split it all off. We only had to run one fiber line to go from point A to point B and encapsulate all of it. So there's it's, it's something else to throw into your uh, design consideration when you're building these. Yeah, absolutely. Those are some very good points. And you brought up naming, you know, how, how they don't like the, the naming inconsistencies, but that's going to happen. Um, this is so hilarious in my, well, it is in my opinion. Anyway, I, I go to my local store to buy a network cable because I'm doing um, right now a, a 10 node Raspberry Pi cluster video, and it's going to have power over ethernet, but I was missing one cable and I didn't have one. So I have to go to the store and buy one like anyone else. And I bet you'd think that on the box it says Ethernet cable or or something like that. No, it's called a streaming media cable. That's what's on the package of this Ethernet cable. It's a streaming media cable, and I'm like, you can't possibly dumb it down any more than that. Like, um, <laughs> I laugh about it, but it makes sense because the average person is probably going to use it for that. It's an Ethernet cable. It's a it's a Cat five E cable. Um, but it's like, really, like, that's what it's come down to. We call these streaming media cables now. Oh, my gosh. It's just going to keep going from here, I, I bet. It's just hilarious. Streaming media cable. <laughs> yeah, they will name all kinds of different things. I think we covered all the physical layer topics here as much as we can. Uh, is there anything else we have to add? I think I'm down to the end of my list now. Yeah, I think that's basically about it. I mean, moral of the story, you know, you just start with what you have. If you have a uh, desktop in your closet, and you could put another network card in there, you know, just try to see what you could do to make that a router. Um, perhaps if you have some other equipment lying around you can use, and then you could upgrade, um, like Tom said, just make sure if you implement VLANs, you need VLANs uh, or the capability for VLANs on every component in the chain. Just keep that in mind, make logical decisions, um, just research well, don't just impulsively buy anything, uh, buy good cables, not, you know, the $30 roll of cables from the corner <laughs> floor, you know, just buy some good cabling. And I think with that alone, you'll be in great shape yep. because that's going to get you going. Yeah. And as I said, I will make sure I leave a lot of links uh, in the show notes. We're going to start doing that. It was a suggestion. Thank you for all of you. Um, those are things that we're always working to improve this podcast. So and listening to all your feedback has been great, but I'll make sure to show notes on this because, well, I talked about a lot of things. I want to make sure I have all the links so you can just go find them instead of trying to pause a podcast and figure out what I said. Um, and me and Jay have some other plans. We're going to start adding some Q&A sessions. So stay yep. tuned, subscribe. We This is officially a podcast now that uh, is linked to the homelab.show where you can download this and wherever good podcasts are consumed, whatever app makes you happy. We've got them listed everywhere now and a website. So if you don't have an app, you just want to download directly, 
you can. I know a lot of you did because we got a bandwidth warning. I was, I, that was, that's like a sign of success. <laughs> that's when you get a bandwidth warning, like everyone else. Oh no, we got a bandwidth warning. We're like, yeah. A bandwidth yeah. Warning. That's that what one. I wanted. It, it's mostly because when I created the web template uh, on our, our, for a hosting server, I didn't give it enough bandwidth or I didn't predict the popularity of the show. Either way, it is, it, I upped the bandwidth so we don't have any more warnings. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess it's going well. Maybe I should um, cancel my plans of uh, putting an ad on a billboard on I-75 in Detroit then. I got think we're probably... Yeah, we don't, apparently we don't need a billboard. So thank you all very much for joining us today. And uh, like I said, uh, look for us. We're trying to keep this as regular as possible. Life life happens, but we're, we're trying to keep this weekly. Um, we will be getting to some projects. Both of us have lots of projects you can look at on our each of our channels, lawrencesystems.com for me and learnlinux.tv for Jay. Definitely, um, we, we've definitely dove deeper into some of these topics. Uh, hopefully this was helpful and look to see and look to hearing from some of you on the live stream and feedback from the next episode. All right. Thanks. Thank you.